Uh, Christian is a contributing editor at The Nation, um, is now teaching full-time at Brooklyn College, and um, as you can see is the a, is a author of Tropic of Chaos, The Freedom, which is about the uh, American occupation of uh, Iraq, um, The Soft Cage, a, a history of uh, surveillance, and then Lockdown America, which is a look at uh, the um, sort of the, what I would hesitatingly call maybe the prison industrial complex in the United States, and, and the history of that, and, and for that matter the future. And um, so with that, welcome to Christian. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So we thought we'd start with a, with a, a pretty straightforward question. Um, you know, Tropic of Chaos um, is an interesting, you refer to the, in it you refer to the catastrophic convergence of three forces. And their geographic sort of uh, manifestation too. So Tropic of Chaos is sort of a specific zone that you identify. So I was wondering if you could just sort of introduce us to, first of all, where uh, your focus on in this book and what this catastrophic convergence is. The, the, uh, the Tropic of Chaos is kind of um, just a play on um, the space between you know, the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, the Global South. And, and it's in the Global South that you find most of the climate-driven violence. And this is a book about how climate change is already causing violence by exacerbating pre-existing crises and turning them into violent crises or turning up the level of violence. And most of that is happening in the Global South. There's also an element uh, of climate violence that is discernible in the Global North, but it looks more like repression, policing, xenophobic policies. In the Global South, climate violence looks like banditry, civil war, failed states, counterinsurgency. Um, and the catastrophic convergence is much more important to the book than the title name. But the catastrophic convergence is, is this idea that climate change arrives in the global south on a stage preset for crisis. And there are two pre-existing crises that this third crisis of anthropogenic climate change is now interacting with. And those are the legacy of the Cold War and the legacy of radical free market economics or neoliberal economic restructuring that has been the dominant philosophy coming out of economics programs and being promulgated by the major international financial institutions like the World Bank and the IMF for over 30 years. So the Cold War has left, and I can get into more detail of this stuff later if you, if you wish, in the Cold War, one of its legacies was to litter the global south with cheap weaponry and bands of men trained in uh, the arts of warfare, interrogation, smuggling, assassination, small unit combat, torture, that sort of stuff. The effect of neoliberalism has been to generally increase inequality, which is important because sociologists, particularly criminologists, note that Instability, crime, um, rebellion, whether you like the rebellion or don't like crime, regardless of that, that, that inequality is associated with instability and violence frequently because people frequently rebel or take violent action, they break rules, they violate social norms when they experience their um, deprivation, not just in absolute terms, but in terms relative to what could be or should be or was or ought to be. So this is called relative deprivation. And so I mean this is what drives crime and drives revolutions. It drives good things, it drives, you know, I mean we're seeing it now with Occupy Wall Street, right? It's not just absolute deprivation, it's this idea of relative deprivation. It's like, wait a minute, you know, we are asked to make an extra fat sacrifice, whereas the banks got bailed out and then the bonuses returned to normal. That's an example of kind of relative deprivation triggering a kind of uh, opposition. So anyway, inequality is associated with upheaval and violence. But also, uh, neoliberalism has been associated in many cases with an increase in absolute uh, poverty. In many places, it's been associated with stagnant growth rates and an increase in the total amount of poverty. But even where, as in, say, India, it has been associated with really robust growth rates and actually a lot of people rising out of poverty, there is this increased inequality. And that is crucial for explaining kind of like antagonistic dynamics that we find. So 
you've got a world littered with guns and people trained in, in the dark arts of warfare. You've got absolute poverty. You've got a withdrawal of the state as part of neoliberalism. Uh, you know, the, the theory behind it is that the market is omnipotent and omniscient and that the state only gets in the way and so therefore there shouldn't be subsidies to small farmers, there shouldn't be state-owned utilities, etc., etc., etc. Now into this context comes extreme weather links to climate change like droughts and freak storms and so people in the global south who frequently live with a much smaller economic margin of error don't have the state to fall back on if a drought wipes out their crop or strikes the fish away because the you know, reason has forced the state to withdraw. And frequently, some of the only methods available for adaptation are weapons left over from the Cold War and affiliation with bands of armed men that might have begun as communist insurgents or, or once upon a time uh, you know, police irregulars fighting communist insurgents or whatever now are just sort of like detached bands of armed men roaming the landscape. So this plays out very differently in different places but these three forces again and again combine in very different combinations. So sometimes you can see that neoliberalism is kind of like in the foreground sometimes it's Cold War militarism. For example, Afghanistan. There's no real history of neoliberalism there. That's not why Afghanistan is a mess. It's not because there was some program of privatization. Mexico, lots of neoliberalism. Some Cold War kind of militarism, but mostly neoliberalism is really the kind of direct cause. So it's different in different places. Um, it's, it's, I mentioned in, uh, the, what you described about the role of the state. Um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned in the book is that, and that you're describing now, is that there's a, almost a feudal dissolution of the state, and that the presence of governmental power or the presence of a kind of um, regulating administrative authority is limited to this archipelago effect of the, the forward operating base or the police station or the government complex in the center of town, but everything else then is, 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 is effectively, to use, it, over, to use a, a, a loose term, is, is anarchic. Whereas in the global north, as you refer to it, the state is doing the exact opposite. It's, it's hardening, it's fencing its borders, it's uh, increasing in you know, federal and local power. Uh, I'm just curious if you could just talk about that dynamic how governmentality is, is changing in, in, in the face of these terrestrial changes that we want to find Well, um, what Jeff's referring to is this one chapter about failed states, which is, uh, has, in most conversations about this book, has been kind of overlooked. And I intentionally deal, I, first of all, intentionally use the, the term failed state, which many progressives really don't like. This is sort of a, the nomenclature of the right. But I, I kind of think that failed states are real, and it's like pornography or art, you know it when you see it. Uh, and it, it failed, they fail, and I think it's a, a legitimate term to use because failed states fail for people in progressive politics, and they also fail for um, capitalism. Uh, not that that's a goal that, uh, you know, that's, that's not my great lament, but there are people on the left who say, well, why, why are you talking about failed states? You know, big business can use it. Capitalism can, can still get uh, coltan out of East Congo. It's like, yes and no. You know, I mean, a failed states are really not actually open for business. They're not totally safe for investment. I mean, Somalia is a black hole of violence. Where, I mean, you can't go in there and, you know, buy up land from poor peasants. I mean, there's just, there's no rule of law. Um, there are a few places like, uh, you know, Colombia, you know, parts of Colombia that are linked to the world economy, can this sort of stuff. But it's really, in many ways, off limits for capital. That's not a moral point. I'm not saying that's good or bad. That's just to like to to insist that there is an actual failure, even for the systems of profit making and extraction that one might critique. And there's certainly a failure for progressive politics in places where there is, um, you know, no functioning state. And these places are, you know, Somalia is the most, it's the first and still quintessential modern failed state. It collapses as a direct result of the Cold War. Uh, and it collapsed in 1991. There hasn't been a functioning government there since. I've noticed in recent months, the press has been discussing Somalia as if there is a functioning government, and there isn't. You know, I mean, there's a quarter of the issue where there is there's a, an internationally supported force that calls itself the government of Somalia, but the country is not under the control of any kind of a state. 
And that was sort of the first modern failed state. And then there, Afghanistan, most of it is definitely a failed state. I mean, Iraq still, I mean, much of it, uh, you know, is a failed state. You go up the, the uh, Euphrates River Valley, um, there's no real law and order. Um, so anyway, and, and you know, throughout the world, one finds these, you know, states or pieces of states that have collapsed. And there's certainly no room for progressive politics. There's no room for women's organizations. There's no room for trade unions. There's no room for organizing of any sort in a, in a land that's run by teenagers with machine guns at checkpoints. So anyway, that's a little caveat there. But so uh, in terms of your question, um, what I was trying to do then, in first, like using this term, which is kind of usually where the discussion begins and stops with most people have discussed this book with, but then kind of like look at how even in a failed state there's still this kind of like patchwork of sovereignty and there's this relative failure. And, and so you get this, exactly what you're talking about, this sort of archipelago of control and you might have a uh, foreign occupying force in the capital city controlling that region, but then you go to the sort of second port city, take for example, you know, Cote d'Ivoire, where you know the main port city to the east of Abidjan is um, San Pedro, and uh, you know it's there are police there, there's military there, but the real power are the exporters who buy the cocoa um, and control the port, and there are these kind of links of control from the port to their warehouses to these interior warehouses, and they have informal relationships with the police and with the military when, and for, for Fortune Magazine actually I did a story um, about this with Jessica Dumont, who I was mentioning to you earlier. Um, we, we found like farmers who were trying to organize collectives to demand better prices from Cargill to whom they sold their, their cocoa. And they were thwarted by these uh, layers of um, you know, informal sovereignty that ultimately went back to the companies. You know, the, the, the local cops, in this one case, you know, dragged, dragged these guys in for not paying their loans to Carbill and held them in this um, cell. So there's, that's at a certain level a collapse and breakdown of law and order, but it's also this kind of like, you know, neo-feudal structure. I mean, it's like, it's, it's what, when you read the history of the 14th century Europe, you know, the post-plague world, that you, that's, that's the pattern of power that you see this bishop with control over here, this uh, foreign occupying army in that area, you know, a few well-heeled uh, merchants who uh, you know, have hired militias or mercenaries to control certain routes for them. So that, what that chapter, The Rising of Failed State, is about is trying to kind of like get more detail about the geography of, of failed states. Um, isn't this a capitalism in the developed world? This lack of the, these failed states. I mean, I can't help but think the United States aided Afghanistan to become a failed state when it had a chance, let's say, in 1975. Um, and Iraq, we got rid of Hussein. Um, and, you know, the, the, the the raw materials that are useful that are kept cheap for certain companies to benefit. I guess I, I yeah. think there's a you know these things are possibly to the benefit of certain sectors. Of there's a, there's an element frequently it, uh, it, in which you can see that specific industries can find ways to profit from these situations. I don't think that it benefits capitalism. I think again returning to Somalia. I mean, Somalia has been so badly abused by the international community, and now you know, piracy is spreading out into the Indian Ocean. That doesn't benefit capitalism to have to, you know, for the, the major shipping lines to have to like now hire security guards and for everybody to be sending their militaries into the Indian Ocean. That that raises costs, and there, I mean, the reason that there is this enclave of external, largely U.S. funded control. In Mogadishu, the reason there was an Ethiopian U.S. invasion, U.S. funded, was because there's, there is this attempt to kind of put it back together to some extent. Um, 
Similarly, in, in Congo, with the fall of uh, uh, Mobutu, you know, there was an attempt that partially worked to construct enough of a semblance of a state to be able to navigate the river, to be able to get illegal log timber out, the, you know, and coltan out. Uh, and it was not at all clear that that would happen. And Joseph Kabila, the son of Ram Kabila, has kind of delivered that to some extent. But I think it's important to make the distinction between specific industries that can get access to specific resources and the needs of the system as a whole. And it, it's clear that the, uh, the dominant capitalist states, the US and the European powers, have in many ways throughout the Cold War helped create these situations. But I don't think that means that they wanted this. I mean, like, I mean, Somalia, to get back to Somalia, Somalia's, the, the story of the tragedy of Somalia is that there is a socialist uh, coup d'etat in 1969, and Saeed Bari emerges as the dictator and he declares himself a socialist, and that socialism is compatible, scientific socialism is compatible with the pastoralist form of life and with Islam. And the Cubans are in Africa, not at the behest of the Soviet Union. They're there, they've gone in there on their own unilaterally. Very, an excellent book that I mentioned in, in my book um, by Piero Glias is called Conflicting Agendas, Havana and Washington in Africa. And Cuba went into Africa when uh, Angola was getting independence from Portugal. And Portugal had been fighting this long colonial war there. And then there was finally a coup d'etat by left-wing officers in Portugal, who were all kind of uh, veterans of the counterinsurgency in Guinea-Bissau and Angola and Mozambique. And they overthrow the dictatorship that had existed in Portugal since the 20s. There's Salazar, and he's replaced by, I forget the guy's name. So they had this coup d'etat, and then they're like, OK, we're wrapping these African wars up. It's over. Enough is enough. And they are going to finally grant Angola independence. And so there's, a, there's this scramble. Who's going to control Angola? Is it going to be the MPLA, which is Marxist Leninist, or is it going to be basically South Africa? And there's this invasion with South African and CIA uh, support by uh, supporting um, UNITA, Joseph Savimbi's uh, rebel army, and uh, another one run by Holden Roberto, the FLAN, which then falls apart. And they're racing for the lawn with the capital. And the MPLA are there defending the capital. And Fidel Castro unilaterally sends 180 Cuban special forces to go defend the capital. And he, he, he like, sees them all from the tarmac. It's chilling. He's like, he's like you, it, it pains me to send you to do this without going myself. Many of you will not come back. Your orders are to fly to Luanda, defend the capital. And if you can't, we have a friendly embassy in Zambia and get there. And so they like they fight this amazing battle with these two front things, and then more Cuban troops rush in there. And then they tell the Soviets, by the way, we're in Angola. And it's a cafe to complete. They don't ask permission. The Soviets are like, oh, wow, OK. Uh, and so then Cuba, Fidel really has this idea of like you know socialism in Africa, and he starts aiding um, different revolutions, not all of which are so great. So he ends up aiding Saeed Bari. Then there's a coup d'état in Ethiopia, and Ethiopia and Somalia have bitter rivalries, in large part because Ethiopia controls a large piece of Somali-speaking territory, the Ogden region. And Saeed Bari, along with being a socialist and whatever else, was mostly a Somali irredentist nationalist who wanted to reunite the homeland. And he, so there's this coup d'etat, so they're, 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 they're nominally socialist sister states, and the Cubans are, are actually in both states, and Saeed Bari begins this covert war into the Ogden region, a war that goes on to this day, and then finds out that the Cubans are on the other side, and he switches the side. And so then the Carter administration, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, start pouring in aid to Saeed Bari. And the Soviets and the Cubans start pouring in aid to the Ethiopians. Now, neither Jimmy Carter nor Fidel Castro wanted to destroy Somalia. They were fighting this big struggle on a global scale through this proxy conflict that had very local qualities and causes to it. The end result was that, that the Somali army, the Somali army, fell apart and with it the state. I mean, that's how the war ended in 1991. And it was not the intention of 
the U.S. or global capitalism to destroy Somalia. And it certainly was the intention of Fidel Castro to, you know, destroy um, Somalia. I mean, it was, you could say it was incredibly reckless and dangerous and foolish um, and arrogant to think that, you know, force of arms justified by socialism makes it okay. But the end result, again and again, um, I mean, a big part of this book is about the landscape produced by the Cold War and the unintended consequences at the level of the landscape, and that's what Afghanistan is. And then after the Cold War, the War on Terror, we see this again now. I mean, Iraq is another one of these functional failed states produced, you know, you know not intentionally, but um, not well, without that's prediction. <laughs> you haven't convinced me that it wasn't somewhat intentional. Okay, well, <laughs> I try. Maybe in the Somalia. So one thing I'm, I'm curious about is given, you know, the, the failure of so many of the states in your book and this sort of idea that, you know, there's a different, there's going to be a different way of organizing society in these states, um, you end the book with sort of this, and we, we talked about this earlier, with this uh, strong kind of, you know, the state is the answer. So I'm, I'm curious uh, that what it would, what is the possible future of the, of the nation state? And um, um, what do you think it needs to be? Why is the nation state sort of the answer? The reason I come down like uh, ultimately for uh, the nation state is because I think that um, there has to be a force that can stand up to and contain the market. That, that in, in capitalism is, I mean, I don't think that um, I'm not a I'm not a revolutionary socialist. I don't think that socialism is on the agenda, really. Particularly in the um, uh, within the time frame of climate change. I mean, the the science, which we can get into in a second, one is pretty clear that we don't have enough time to transform society before dealing with this. Problem, like dealing with this problem has to lead. Now that hopefully can deal, that, that can lead on to a transformation of society. Um, and so, um, I don't have any utopian notions about revolution in that regard. And it's also partly because it, I, it, you know, I spent time in, in uh, uh, you know, Nicaragua, Cuba, Venezuela, the Soviet Union, and it's very hard to run a socialist economy. And um, I guess I've become kind of a social democrat over the years. It's like I think that a mixed economy is really kind of the best way. And that what that means is treating capitalism and market forces as a necessary evil that have to be subordinated. Their kind of Promethean power has to be channeled and controlled by government planning and state oversight. And that, that the process of profit maximization and investment for profit maximization can be incredibly dangerous and is ultimately, as Marx and the whole Marxist tradition has argued, is fundamentally self-destructive. I mean, that left to its own devices, that's where the market goes. Like, off the edge of a cliff is where capitalist society goes. And I end the book by discussing the, the idea of the metabolic rift that Marx and Engels come up with, the, the idea that capitalism and the earth are fundamentally conflict because capitalism can grow forever and the earth is finite. And you know, I, I think that's ultimately true, but I don't think that leads you necessarily to say, therefore, you have to overthrow capitalism before you can deal with this problem of the limits of the planet. Quite the contrary, due to climate change, you know, we are at, science, scientists are pretty clear that 350 parts per million is when you start hitting tipping points. We're at 390 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. We're already crossing point at which this problem can become self-sustaining, self-fueling, when the symptoms feed back and exacerbate the cause. So the easiest example of this is that if the permafrost in the Arctic melts sufficiently, there'll be a massive release of methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas 30 times, well, 20 times more powerful than uh, CO2. Once that really happens, it doesn't really matter what human civilization does, it becomes a self-fueling process. So we're at the point where we really need to make radical changes 
to the basis, the technological basis of our economy now. And I just don't think it's realistic to um, change all social relations and all environmental problems before dealing with where our fuel comes from. So I think that the idea of the metabolic rift is very valid, but that what, what we have to do with climate change is sort of buy time to deal with the rest of the problems. Buy time to see how we might destroy ourselves and our civilization later. Because it's very clear that we're, you know, we're, and it sounds crazy to say sitting here in this nice office in New York and kind of glass of wine, but like, you know, the science is very clear that the, the effects lag the cause um, by decades and, you know, we are heading out over the edge and we have to act now. So, I, I, as far as just sticking with that notion of the state and the nation state, I'm, 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 I, I think there's, there's that sort of tension between the, the, the hardening of the state and an almost sort of what, you know, shorthand, maybe like a Patriot Act it's kind, of, kind of way, where you have a sort of calcification of, of, of the state as a, as a controlling mechanism, as, a, as an administrative, maybe if you're going back to the soft cage, it becomes, it's the, it's the hardened cage. Right. Um, and so does that vision of the state where it's responding to resource scarcity, it's responding to mass, what it perceives as mass migration, um, a hardening of borders, et cetera. I guess I'm just curious how then, how you those two. yeah, there's the vision of the sort of, there's the liberal, in the American sense of the word, liberal democratic state, which can be sort of the answer to poverty or the or the the, 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 the Patriot Act sort of system. But I I I guess I'm just curious. So it's, 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 it's like so it's if if capitalism is, is a necessary evil, so too is the state a necessary evil. And it's like, you know, the, the nature of the capitalist state as it has developed and accreted powers to itself over the last thirty years is repressive in a fashion that generally supports economic privilege. But there is also a considerable element in what government does that is redistributive and progressive and puts limits on capitalism. And I think those need to be enhanced, they need to be identified, they need to be discussed. And I'm also, I mean, this is sort of what my next project is about. Um, this, you know, I've got four, four books of basically attacking the state. You know, the state is clearly my subject, and so now I'm going to defend it. Um, but the idea that communities are going to um, sort this out for themselves, that it's going to be some sort of post-nation state form of power that's going to stand up to Exxon Mobil, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So what we have in real terms here in the United States is the EPA, and we have enabling legislation, the Clean Air Act. The EPA is obliged to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. It's not doing it. We're waiting for 30 rules to be issued. They're not doing it. You know, I mean, realistically, how are we going to deal with this? It's not going to be something that we can't imagine. It's going to be the EPA imposing a de facto carbon tax on the oil industry and the oil industry, and thereby channeling private investment towards clean energy. We can see how this would work. You know, already activists have, using existing laws, have defeated 130 coal plants that were set to be built. That's a lot of carbon dioxide that's not going to go into the atmosphere. The, the EPA. Um, has rescinded an existing uh, massive mountaintop removal uh, permit. Those are things that go in the right direction. Alternately, uh, the Obama administration told the EPA to ease off on ozone, ground level ozone rules recently. Ground level ozone is produced when greenhouse gases interact with sunlight at ground level and, and create ozone, which tears up our lungs. So that ground level ozone rule is also in effect a greenhouse gas rule. Because the way you would amend, the way you would reduce ground level ozone is by going back to the sources and not letting it, these greenhouse gases out. So I'm not, I have no illusions about um, the possibility of this happening, but that's realistically, that's how we would get, you know, that's how we would buy time um, to transform our energy economy um, over the next decade or two through these existing institutions, these rules coming out of the state. And then of course there'll be a role for for private industry and innovation and private investment and product making and all that in developing these new technologies. But that alone isn't going to do it. I mean there has to be a, a, a suppression and a repression of one faction of the fossil fuel industry. I mean it needs the state to control and contain and repress it if there's going to be a new industry, clean tech industry, uh, that, that emerges to develop, um, you know, energy for us. Yes? I was just 
know, something that I found interesting just within the first couple pages of this book, um, that here in the US, and you just touched on this recently, talking about the EPA and the administration telling Lisa Jackson to sort of back off of ozone rights. Um, but it seems like there's sort of a wax and wane with climate change deniers in the US, and right now we're sort of on an uptick, and it seems like EPA, the administration, um, our environmental protectors are sort of maybe giving in a bit to climate change deniers, but the way we practice abroad seems to be an embrace of climate change, at least military planning. Um, seems to be acknowledging the reality of climate change and its strategies. And I just find it fascinating that both of those things exist in the same place and we can accept it for the way we act abroad, but not for the way we act at home. Yes, except that, um, I mean, it's not that there is enforced mitigation of the causes abroad and uh, uh, no mitigation of the causes at home. What there is is a kind of violent adaptation abroad and a total permissiveness towards the uh, original problem, which is to say no mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. So in a way, they're compatible in that regard. Uh, ExxonMobil and the coal industry and the Koch brothers, these types, are not threatened by the Pentagon saying, we accept the science coming out of the inter Inter intergovernmental panel on climate change as real and we build our military scenarios upon their conclusions. I mean, they don't like it and they suppress it and they want people to talk about climate change, but um, there is no direct conflict. I mean, the military, it says occasionally in these documents that ultimately, you know, we can, in the short term, kind of put a military, a militarized lid on the first stages of the problem, but beyond that, it's really up to policymakers who are going to address the root causes, which are mitigation, and they say that. And those things get filed on the web, and you can read them, and whatever, and if they're not discussed. And, um, so I think that just in terms of that contradiction, and I mean, one useful thing is that, like, you know, conservatives who uh, don't believe the science and, and uh, venerate the military ought to look at the military and see what they think of it. And that, I hope that that's one useful thing that comes out of this book to like inform these people that one of their favorite institutions takes this science very seriously. And in terms of the ebb and flow, I mean, I think you're completely right in your description of it. And it's like, I think it's it's the, the result of serious concerted pushback that there was um, the fourth uh, and uh, assessment report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is. The clearinghouse, the UN run clearinghouse where all science is vetted and government and industry sort of have a quote in it. So it's not that conservative at all. It's very, like, you know, close common denominator. And, and they're tasked with producing every four years a kind of summary of the state of the science and a set of, um, to put it in terms that policymakers around the world can use to devise government policy. And so after the, the last one, which was the fourth assessment report, there was quite a bit of concern. And the Wars movie came out, and everybody was looking towards the negotiations in Copenhagen, which were going to come up with a successor agreement to the Kyoto Protocol. And there was a rise in concern about this. And then there was concerted pushback by the industries that are threatened directly by any kind of shift to clean energy. you got to remember, like, the oil and coal industry have billions and billions of dollars in sunk capital, you know, in the form of oil wells and pipelines and refineries that if you are not producing and refining oil are going to become scrap metal. So it's, it's, it's way beyond any kind of abstract notion about money making. It's really about these investments that they've already made in trying to, to profit from them. And they've pushed back, as, as I'm sure you all know, by investing in counter messaging and influencing the Republican Party. And as a result, we have, you know, these Republican camp, like people like Mitt Romney once upon a time said he believed in the science of climate change and now has questions. And so there's been this pushback. And then even the Obama administration seems to be, in the case of the ozone rules, like really just cowering in the face of that concerted organizing. 
But on the other hand, you know, then there's the pushback from the grassroots, like Bill McKibben and, mm -hmm. and people organizing the, the actions against the Keystone XL pipeline, and that's you know getting the discussion going. Again. Just a, uh, I know Nikki's got a, a, a different question, but just a quick sort of response to that as well. I'd, I'd almost be simultaneously less optimistic, and then I'll, I'll show what maybe why to be more optimistic at the end. But I think that in some cases this is actually like the like the military going for biofuels and looking for affordable solar and that kind of thing. And it's 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 not a I'd say I'd be less optimistic about the scientific rationale. It's not because they're trying to fight climate change, it's because it's cheaper and it, 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 it boosts operational autonomy. And so you can send Marines into the desert when they don't need to you know, bring, you don't need to have supply convoys full of oil coming behind them. And even there was a, an example the other, maybe like a week or 10 days ago, or recently, where I think it's NASCAR is going solar powered or wind powered or some kind of, so when, when there are large NASCAR events, which is sort of the absolute epitome of red state in American sporting events. <laughs> um, you know, but, but it's not because they're all thinking of it's not because they think of climate change, just because it's cheaper. You know, but and that's it's easier to set up. Anyway. Well, exactly. Well, so that's why I was gonna say that in the end, it's like ironically I'd actually say that there. Yeah, yeah. I'd say that in some ways the left has missed or rather I shouldn't say the left, I should say people who have been pushing for climate change awareness have missed an opportunity uh, to simply point out the benefits of flexibility and Cheap and uh, economic uh, uh, cheapness, affordability. But and military instead of technology that, you know, development, and that will be, it can, it, it, in that sense, what you just cited is our It's positive, optimistic. Yeah. Right? Well, uh, and I, I think, as you mentioned in the book, you know, if you can put the military R and D budget <coughs> toward um, clean technology, that will drive the type of mitigation that we need. Uh, whereas, you know, if, if you're putting it all toward but it's also, so just really quickly, I guess, it's also the weird moral dilemma, though, is that the, 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 the military is one pushing it because they are, like, DARPA is very enthusiastically supporting biofuel research right now, but then the flexible solar, you know, it sounds like an amazing thing, but the weird sort of dark side is that the reason, one of the reasons why, I mean, there are multiple reasons, but is that we can send troops deeper into deserts and they, they're more autonomous. And so it's, it's, I think it's an interesting moral dilemma that the military, DARPA, et cetera, might push for an incredibly high efficiency solar system that in turn is used to increase the efficiency and depth of, of US soldier movement and drone operations. Yeah, kind of, nice that, that's the story. That's what we, what we have in the United States instead of industrial policy and military policy, mm -hmm. and from it comes mm -hmm. you know, technological innovation. Yeah. But I think the issue actually is less uh, innovation than it is scaling up existing technologies. And what I talk about it, um, in large part in the end of the book is the idea of using government spending to help build uh, markets for existing technologies and scale them up. So the, the state sector, federal government plus states, without counting the overlap, so making sure there's no overlap, constitutes, it was a, it was a high year when I did this calculation because it was a uh, stimulus time and a decline and the, the uh, private sector activity. But it was 38% of the US GDP in like 2008. So, you know, let's knock off some, uh, let's say it's 30% normally when the private sector is booming and, and the government doesn't play such a big role in the economy. But that's an enormous amount of purchasing power potentially to push markets. And so the federal government has the largest single fleet of buildings in the country. It's the largest single consumer of energy. A lot of that's military, but you know, a lot of it's their vehicle fleets in the buildings. The post office alone you know, has like 180,000 vehicles that park in, most of them park in the same place every night. They on average do an 18 mile loop every day. I mean, they're perfect for electrification. The post office is going to replace these vehicles. They, they break, they wear out, and they have to, and they buy new ones. Why not buy electric vehicles? Why not make the postal fleet electric? If they did that, that would have amazing effects in and of itself. It would help reduce the government sector's carbon footprint, but it would have this knock-on effect of creating a market for battery uh, manufacturers, electric car retrofitters, etc., etc. And currently, those kinds of firms in the U.S. are suffering very badly because they don't have markets. And I mean, one of my critiques of the um, Solyndra thing, scandal, whatever you want to call it, and one of my critiques of the defense of it, the way people are talking about it, is like, no, of course it's a disaster. I mean, what do you expect? 
If your plan is to shovel money into like a little a detached boutique manufacturer, then I mean that's not a plan. You know, was was the government ready to buy everything they produced for ten years as well? I mean, like that's not how you do it by just giving cash money to a manufacturer that doesn't have a market. The government could create tremendous markets. And, and actually, a lot of these private firms that produce these technologies, that's what they need more than life support cash from the government. They need purchase, purchases from the government. And that's, you know, that's a really untapped aspect of this whole thing. There were a lot of people done. And the beauty of it is it doesn't require permission from the lunatic fringe of the Republican Party. You know, they don't have to sign off on some special program of um, subsidies. This is just, you know, the post office will buy vehicles. The government um, services agency, which is like the kind of building manager and janitor for the federal government, you know, like, it will be buying electricity for its office buildings. Will it be from wind or will it be from coal? I mean, it's going to buy electricity, period. So there's a lot of room for that. So Switching tactic just a tiny bit. Um, I, I want to, you know, because UX is so focused on the, the future of cities, I want to <coughs> extrapolate a little bit and pull out some threads from Tropic of Chaos to sort of help us think about the possible futures of cities. And um, I one one and wondered if you could sort of speculate a little bit. I, I think uh, you know the food and water shortages that you that you point to as a result of climate change um, will obviously threaten urban supply chains very heavily. You talked about the sort of possibility of economic damage to coastal cities and infrastructural damage. Um, and then also this kind of idea of, of uh, the, the fortress urbanism is happening there. But then also, one thing that I thought was curious was there's a, there's a chapter um, the whole chapter that uh, in the book, which um, is a very sort of uh, absorbing description of cattle raids in um, and how they how you know all of the threads that are that are going on in what looks like a tribal cattle raid, you know, um, and but what's curious about that is it has a relationship to urban centers as well. It looks like it's happening in the, in a valley. In Middle of nowhere, but actually, it's highly tied to sort of urban structures and feeds back sort of in a loop between. And so, I guess I'm curious about how the geographies that you're describing are, are going to affect cities and are going to affect the relationship that cities have to their, their various sheds, as it were the food sheds, water sheds. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that a lot of, um, a lot of the conflict in cities is basically displacement of, of rural crisis from these various sheds into the cities. And that's what I tried to do in the, the section on Brazil. I looked at how the, um, the, the area of Brazil, the northeast, the nordeste, that's the, always in a semi-arid region with kind of extreme climate is where climate change is really kicking in now. It's also the region from which most people have migrated south to Rio and Sao Paulo. And they, you know, arrive in these cities for various reasons, but increasingly it's partly to escape the extreme weather and the economic fallout of that associated with climate change. So they, you know, they, they end up in these favelas, and then in these favelas they confront these paramilitary drug gangs that actually have their roots in guerrilla, urban guerrilla armies against, that were fighting the uh, dictatorship in the um, 80s, 70s, and 80s. Um, the current president, uh, Dilma Rouif, uh, I always mispronounce her name, but I don't speak Portuguese, um, and she actually comes out of the same, the same thing. She was uh, an urban guerrilla, and she was captured, jail, tortured. She was associated with the group that actually kidnapped the American uh, ambassador, Charles Bunker. And um, so, you know, she joined the Workers' Party and rose to the ranks of the PT and is now president, first woman president. But other people mixed with the kind of um, regular criminal element in 
the prisons and try to organize these revolutionary armies and institutions, the main one being um, the, um, the Red Command is what it becomes, which is by the late 80s no longer really political and is just a drug gang. And now it's absolutely not a drug gang. I mean, it's, not, it's not, absolutely not political, it's just a major drug gang. So people are pushed off the land in the Northeast, they come into the favelas of Rio, and they find themselves in a, a place where the state really has limited control, and where the Red Command deals with issues of law and order, and taxes the local businesses, um, taxes slash extorts them, whatever. And so there is this um, level of violence between the state and the major drug gangs all which kind of cleave off from the Red Command in Rio, at Commando Vermelo. And um, so the police go into these favelas in armed columns, you know, platoon-sized armed columns, and have firefights with these drug gangs. And there's something like a low-intensity conflict going on in these neighborhoods in Rio. It's not reducible to, but it's definitely increasingly linked to the crisis on the land in the Northeast, where most people who come to Rio come from. And again, again, I think you're going to see that in cities, and you can unpack these, these uh, crises in the land that then don't show up as violence in rural areas, but get displaced through time and space into cities and show up as crime, religious fanaticism, various times, types of violent desperation, to which the state responds with policies that frequently exacerbate situation of just, you know, violence, rather than really like, if you, if you really wanted to, in the long term, control the drug violence in the favelas of Rio, it would be, it would involve a large component of, of supporting appropriate technology on the land in the Northeast to adapt to climate change. And there's some of that adaptation going on. Um, people are using all sorts of very interesting, um, uh, you know, kind of cheap Technologies to to live better on this semi-arid land in this extreme climate, but it and it gets help from you know like the Catholic uh, NGO Caritas and stuff like that, but it's not really at the center of state policy, which has to be as part of doing climate change. I have a question now that you, uh, following from your flip flop in support of the state now. <laughs> but uh, whether you think, so are you kind of dismissing the possibility of global civil society coming up with the kind of solutions or you know, providing support for the solutions that we need to, to uh, get policy and the adaptations to climate change? And if that's the case, you see the state with the more authoritarian models of the state give us the quick solutions in terms of policy to do these things. I think about you know, China's going full throttle about economic development. They're also leading on clean coal technology and you know massive support for all sorts of uh, renewables. And whether like what you're saying, the how important it is for us to move extremely quickly, whether you think democracy can keep up with this, or whether authoritarianism. I'm not, I'm not, when, in, in making a case for government action, I'm not making a case for authoritarianism. I don't. I, I'm not in favor of that. Mm -hmm. But I. I what I'm arguing for is a power that can control and contain capital and say, like, no, no, here you may not dump your coal ash. Here you may not blow the top off of a mountain and extract the coal, you know? No, you may not take a billion dollars and speculate in whatever you, however, you can invest in wind farms, you know, and have a tax rate for you that. That kind of containment and control, which is, Frequently very democratic in its outcome and its methods. But I wonder, and it's it's kind of undemocratic in the the undemocratic spaces for the United States where we're doing this adaptation, military spending, etc. And then the, the democratic spaces, domestic politics, where we're blowing it completely. Yeah, but I don't I mean it's, I think it's it's really essentially about the the legal power of the state in both cases, leaving aside any kind of moral question, like in both China and the U.S., it's the legal power of the state to control private investment that is at the heart of planning. Okay? We think there's no planning, we think there's nothing of a mixed economy here, but 
There is. You know, I mean, thirty-eight percent of the GDP of this country was government buying and spending, uh, and there are many rules, and they're being flouted. So there is there is planning, and there is something that brings the economy, and we need to embrace that. And it's like. It happens under under liberal democratic capitals, and it happens under authoritarian states. It can happen under any number of political arrangements. But the point is that it can't be left to the market and to private firms competing against each other to make profits and attract investment to solve these problems. That kind of dynamism that you know Marx and Engels themselves praise in, in tremendous language. Um, while critiquing capitalism, but they also you know, note this sort of Promethean quality. And just, I mean, that, that can be very, very useful, but not when it's allowed to run rampant, when it is contained and channeled and controlled. And, and that's what I'm arguing for. And also, again, in terms of the time frame, it's like, I mean, it's not even like, I mean, for there to be a transformation of the US government, for better or for worse, I mean, is almost not with in the realm of reasonable debate vis-a-vis climate change. It's like we have to really make radical changes in, you know, I, I'm being very optimistic to say this, ten, you know, 10, 30 years. I mean, it, in many ways, it may really already be too late. It's easier to make the case that it's really too late when we're just you know, uh, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titan which we just enjoy our lives and the whole thing collapses. But that's the easy case to make. The harder case to make is like, no, we can do something. Look at all this wealth. Look at all of this intelligence and capacity that this society has. I mean, really, are we just going to really like give up? No, we have this like moral obligation to try and do what we can in every way, right now, and in a really realistic way. And to and to and to, to give up all this, you know, childish concern of being right all the time, and 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 be be pragmatic and effective and really make this happen. I'm curious too, in that in that sense, you know, this this idea of the of the state. I mean, as someone, this is this is irrelevant to the conversation today. But I who, I, just, I find that defending the state is, is an increasingly uh, important thing to do in the era of the Tea Party and not, not to make a political statement. But um, so even just like you know, you said that you've written four books that attack the state. Um, but it's even just use an example of, of something that was interesting. Like you know, in lockdown America, what was interesting and horrific about what was going on in Arizona with the anti-immigration law was that so much of it was being pushed and lobbied for by private prison operators. And that the it, it well, the reason I'm saying that is that in some ways then the state is sort of the wrong is the is the scapegoat, whereas actually it's private corruption of the governing process through lobbying and uh, the profiteering motive of, of a private prison industry. And so in some ways in and that's a very specific instance, um, the state then would actually have been the thing that could have was being corrupted. So my point then is that is is the is the how does one fight this level these sorts of this corrupt, corruption in, in general, which is a huge question. But specifically when you're dealing with things like trying to uh, you know these these the global south or the developing nations or for that matter dissolving nations, how one uh, combats the influence of international agribusiness or of the international uh, you know for that matter arms traders or the extraction industry, you know, Rio Tinto probably has more of a corrupting effect on, on governing uh, governments around the world than, you know, the, the well, Republicans do. But I, I, I just, I just how, how does one, you know, it, it, where does corruption fall into this? I mean, yeah, corruption is a, a huge part of it. I mean, one, one thing, um, just when you were talking, it reminds me of Ira Katz Nelson, who's a political scientist who was, I mean, he was the dean of the New School for a while, but um, he wrote about cities, and I'm not sure he's Anymore, but he, in something I read long ago in graduate school, he talked about you know the state is both a means of class control in a kind of classic Marxist sense, and it's also an arena of class struggle. You know, I mean there are elements of the state that are that are, that, that that do not do the dirty work of big business, and that redistribute wealth and contain it and create a humanized society and 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 create capitalism with a human face. So um, now, where does corruption fit into this? Um, how do how is that controlled internationally? That's a good question. There's initiatives. Part of that gets to the third world state, the state of the global south, and you know there too, I think the state has to be refurbished and, and rejuvenated. And there are 
I'm not uh, an expert on this, but I'm going to look into this more. But you know, there are examples. I read a, a really good book on, while writing this um, about African states by Matthew Lockwood. It's called The State They're In. And he comes out of kind of um, civil society development economics. And, and his argument is that you know you only get you're only going to get development where you have a state that supports development. And he used the example of um, Mozambique, he sort of feels going in that direction, and um, Malawi also. And Malawi, you know, recently has done some interesting things with giving farmers, very, very simple, giving farmers subsidies for fertilizer. And a couple of years of that, and the country is uh, self-sufficient in food. But then the crisis of 2008 comes along, and everyone's, what? Oh, I'm sorry. The crisis of 2008, oh. the international financial crisis, and everyone is holding these debts, and the IMF and World Bank have been pressuring Malawi to cut subsidies to these small farmers. So that's not quite the same as a full-on developmental state, but at the core of the issue is pushing back against neoliberal economics, which hold that uh, markets achieve equilibrium and and work magically when the state gets out of the way. Quite the contrary, capitalism develops when the state plays a supporting and controlling role. And the best example of this is South Korea and the work that Alice Amsden, who's an economist who's up in Boston, has done um, her most famous kind of first book, um, Asia's Next Giant. It's all about how you know South Korea industrialized faster than any country in the world. And the working class there saw a level of income and it's a standard of living rise faster than any in the world. And it was by kind of containing and harnessing the market and um, uh, you know, there was a tremendous class struggle as well. The working class in South Korea fought incredibly hard against the employers and the employers were forced to make these concessions that turned into mass prosperity for the, the working class. But the government of South Korea decided what industries would be developed and they would pick winners and losers, and they would set goals and say, you know, we're going to provide cheap capital for your firm, and you're going to meet, you're going to meet uh, this steel production quota of this quality and this quantity. And if you don't, uh, we're going to just cut you off completely. You're not going to have any capital, and your assets are going to become worthless, and you're going to go into crisis, and we're basically going to parcel you up and give you to your competition. And they would do this. They had laws like um, for capital flight, taking a million dollars or more out of South Korea in the 70s and 80s was minimum punishment 10 years in prison, maximum punishment the death penalty. No, nobody was ever executed, and people were thrown in prison. They would be like, oh, you don't want to invest in South Korean shipbuilding? You want to go speculate in like oh, high business and Swiss bank account? We caught you. You're going to jail. You know, it's like a level of like discipline on capital that's unimaginable in this country. And, but it wasn't about like crushing and destroying business. It was about, no, we have a plan here. We're developing this country. And if you're in and you're on board, you can get rich. You know, you can get rich. But if you want to mess around and try and get something for nothing and not about employing people and building up South Korea, then we're going to put you in jail. And they did it. You know, I mean, that kind of ethos is needed. Like, you're, you're like, okay, yeah, you can exploit labor, you can get rich within these boundaries, and you step out of it, there are consequences. And currently, that's not the case in this country. It's just like, you know, the banking system destroys the regular economy and it's bailed out, and then, you know, it's like, please don't return to the bonus culture of, of your, and they're like, no, we're going to do it anyway. And there's no rules, there's no regulations, you know, the banks are like broken up, and it's, you know, it's ridiculous. I, I suspect we should probably draw things to, to a close time voice, but I was curious about the fact that uh, clearly your book was written before um, the. Yes. <laughs> I, I love being that predictable. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, in the light of the sort of things you're writing about, I mean, I think the Arab Spring um, obviously had a lot of things that uh, fed into it, that among those were rising costs of. Food, um, you know, which is something that you point to as a source of instability in cities. Curious about that, uh, about your 
Yeah. Well, I wrote a piece um, after the book came out about that, and so, in a nutshell, you know, uh, the worst drought in a hundred years, the Black Sea drought, affects the main meat producing areas of the world: uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine. Floods in the Midwest and Canada uh, adversely impact corn production. There's also floods in Australia. And from June 2010 to June 2011, the price of these basic grains goes up. For wheat, it's about 83%. And for corn, um, pushed in part by ethanol subsidies, uh, uh, goes up 91%. Now, as these prices are rising in response to the extreme weather of that year, Glencore, which is the number two, along with Cargill, commodity trader in the world, run by Mark Rich, who is a fugitive from U.S. law from back in the Clinton era. I was like reading my book and I was like, Mark Rich, that's a familiar name. Why do I have that name? Um, they openly, Glencore openly says to Russia, you should, uh, you should uh, ban all grain exports, wheat exports. It seems like you have the right to do it. So Russia, which is one of the top five wheat exporters, cancels its wheat export contracts and the price of wheat soars. Well, who are some of the major wheat importers? Egypt is the single largest importer of wheat in the world. Tunisia, Libya, other countries know that are also major wheat importers. In Egypt, food inflation was running at 20% a year uh, from 2000, June 2010 to 2011, during the whole year of the Arab Spring. The average Egyptian family spends 40% of their income on food, and it's a very political issue. The last thing President Ben Ali of Tunisia did before he fled was promise to lower the price of basic grains. So food was very much the catalyst. I mean, this is, again, not at all reducible to climate change, not reducible to food prices. But when you ask yourself, why, after 30 years of brutal kleptocracy, did the Egyptians and Tunisians rise up this year rather than next year or the previous year or five years ago or five years from now. I think some of it has to do with this sudden spike and the second sudden spike in food prices in about five years. And this one very clearly linked to climate change. So not to reduce it to climate change, but you can see how climate change becomes through this concatenation and displacement. So there's an example of, of really a global shed, right? A food shed affecting, you know, exploding in Tahir Square. Uh, a drought in the Black Sea region expressing itself as political violence in the square. So we have to think in these terms, this international scale, and 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 try and pick out the, the climatological element because um, it's going to be increasingly important. Cool. Thank you very much.